This morning, I'd like each of you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. We're actually going to get into it this time. We introduced it last week, and I just want to begin by reading this genealogy, which may or may not be a great blessing to you, but I'm going to read it. Because it's part of God's Word, right? Just like 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. And he begins by saying the record or the book of the genealogy of Jesus, Yeshua. God saves. Joshua, God saves. The Messiah. The Greek word is Christos. It means the anointed one. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Picks the two greatest men in his genealogy and names them to begin with. He says Abraham was the father of Isaac. Uh, The son of laughter. Why? Because Abraham and Sarah were way beyond childbearing age. And Isaac comes along and Sarah thought it was pretty funny. Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by his own daughter-in-law, Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab the harlot, a Canaanite prostitute. Boaz was the father of Obed, by Ruth. She was a Moabitess, virtuous woman, but came from a nation that Israel hated. And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon. And you all know he had multiple wives. He had multiple sons who became princes and leaders in the kingdom that David ruled. But Solomon by Bathsheba, the gal he committed adultery with, had her husband murdered. The first baby died. But she's the one who's in the genealogy of Messiah. So Solomon was the father of Rehoboam who split the kingdom because he was such an arrogant individual. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asa, who was a godly king. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat, who was a godly son of a godly king. And the fa- he was the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, another godly king, although he went into the temple to offer the sacrifice, and God struck him with leprosy. But he was still a great king. Uzziah was the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, one of the worst kings in the history of Israel. And Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah, one of the best kings in the history of Israel. Interesting. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, who was the worst by far king in the history of Israel. He reigned some 60 years. And toward the end of that, God brought him low and he came back to God. Beautiful picture of grace if you read the story of Manasseh, although he was wicked and evil. And he became the father of Ammon, Ammon the father of Josiah, another godly king who was the last in the line of godly kings. And, and he became the father of Jeconiah or Jehoiachin and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel. And the throne was never really established, so these last few men I read, you won't know who they are, except for maybe Joseph. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud. And Abiud, the father of Eliakim. And Eliakim, the father of Azor. And Azor was the father of Zadok. And Zadok, the father of Akim. And Akim, the father of Eliud. And Eliud was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. And Mathan, the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom, by Mary, not by Joseph, by Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. And then he sums this up beautifully. He says, and this is for memorization, because remember in those days they didn't have printing press and you couldn't get the New York bestseller. This would have been a New York bestseller, by the way. But this is for memorization. You went 14 generations and you knew, and if you ended up with King David or the deportation or the Messiah, you knew you were on track. So he says, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David 
to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to Messiah, 14 generations. There was a purpose for that. And it was for memorization. Now, you might be wondering why this Gospel and the Gospel of Luke chapter 3 begin with such long and detailed genealogies. From our standpoint, it's kind of like, what, what's up with this? But from a Jewish standpoint, this was the most natural and most interesting and indeed the most essential way to begin the story of any man's life. Especially the one who would make the claim to be their Lord and Messiah. To the Jew, everything must line up, every jot and tittle. It must line up properly, judicially, and legally, or the man was a fraud. Messiah must come through the proper bloodlines, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, the kingly line of David. Fail to prove that, and you have not uh, a Messiah, but you have a fraud, you have a false boast, and There are always plenty of those. There are always plenty of frauds and people who want to be the Messiah. You know, Jesus said in the last days, watch out because all kinds of men will be claiming to be the Messiah. But we're going to learn from this genealogy, there can be no Messiah apart from the one that's claimed to be Messiah here. This genealogy, Matthew's aim is to prove beyond a doubt that Jesus the Christ The anointed one is the Messiah, the son of David, the king, the son of Abraham, the father of the Jews, as well as the father of all who will have faith. Genesis 15, 6. We realize that before Abraham was circumcised, it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And that applies to all of us. Do we believe God or don't we? It will be accounted to us as righteousness if we believe God in Him whom God has sent. This is eternal life, to know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom You have sent. To reject this, Matthew wants us to know, we do so at our own peril, and do it because of our own ignorance and hardness of heart, because the facts are all there. Everything about the Christ from the Old Testament according to Old Testament standards, is as it should be. It all lines up. 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 8. Not something else. That's what we need to really see from this genealogy. Now, as you know, we could probably spend months in this genealogy. I just briefly highlighted some of these men. by, But we could look at it in much detail, as many of these lives mentioned uh, are are very noteworthy. But what we're going to do this morning is just sort of hit a few high points. Basically, verse 17. But you know, I would encourage you to get a commentary, go back and study out these lives. Go back to the Old Testament and study the life of Hezekiah. Amazing. I love it in my Bible reading every year when I get to uh, Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, because it just tells the story of these godly men and it tells the story of these worthless kings that both Judah and Israel had. And it, just as a reminder continually to me that I have feet of clay. That like some of these men, I can wallow in sin and, and not worship the true God acceptably in a manner that honors Him and glorifies Him. Or I can be like these godly kings who brought about great reform and great good in their lifetime. And I I just encourage you to do that. But let's hit some of the high points. Let's see the magnum opus, I guess you could say, of this genealogy. So to begin with, this genealogy, verse 17, focuses on four events that define for us much of the history of Israel and consequently the world. And I'll make the statement, as Israel goes, so goes the world. And that's true then, it's true now, and it will be true in the end times if you understand prophecy. So this prophecy focuses mainly on four events. It begins with Abram and Sarai, who would later become Abraham and Sarah, being called by God out of Earl of the Chaldees to begin forming what would become the nation of Israel. 
If you go back and read in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, the promise was given to Abraham that from his seed and from his progeny, all the families of the earth would be blessed. Not just Israel. It wasn't just a promise made to Israel that Messiah would be a blessing to all men. That's been the case, hasn't it? For 2,000 years, we've seen millions upon millions of people come to faith in the Lord Jesus through the seed of Abraham. And if you know anything at all about Scripture, you know that the Savior of the world came through the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the line of David the king, as stated here. Because the significance of Messiah being the son of Abraham was not just a promise to the nations of Israel, but it was a promise for the whole world of fallen men and sinners. That was the point. Messiah would come, but He would come through the nation of Israel, but He would be a Messiah for all people. Romans chapter 4 tells us Abraham is the father of all who believe by faith. Both circumcised, which would be the Jew, and uncircumcised, which would be most Gentiles. So, this genealogy has significance not just to the Jew, but to all men. Because in Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed through the coming of the promised Messiah. The Redeemer, it tells us, was on His way and He had come and He qualified in every respect and the whole world would be blessed by this One. Then secondly, 14 generations later, remember the memorization part, And it it would be good to memorize this genealogy too, by the way. Fourteen generations later, David would be taken from tending his father's sheep and God would sovereignly place him as the kingly shepherd over his people Israel. He was taken from the sheepfold and he went to the throne to shepherd and rule over the sheep of Israel. And David, the son of Abraham, the son of Jesse of the tribe of Judah, would take Israel to new heights of power and worship of the one true God. And when David, his heart in love with God, wanted to build God a temple in Jerusalem to be worshipped at, listen to what is said. Turn to Second Samuel. It's about ten books into the New Testament. Or the Old Testament, sorry. Second Samuel chapter 7. And beginning in verse 8. God puts it in David's heart to build him a temple. Uh, Until that time, God had basically dwelt in a tent, the tabernacle, and that had been set up. But David wants to build him a grand edifice, a temple. And Nathan tells him uh, in verse 3, Go do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. And that was true, but the next night Nathan receives this communication from God that no we're not going to do it through David because David's a man of bloodshed he shed way too much blood to do this but out of this God makes a covenant with the house of David with the throne of David and in verse 8 we begin to hear what God said to Nathan he says now therefore thus you must say to my servant David thus says the Lord of hosts I took you from the pasture from from following the sheep. (laughs) Usually the shepherd leads the sheep, but here, never mind. To be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. And like Alexander the Great, Nebuchadnezzar, all great Gentile kings and David would be right up there with him as far as his name and and power and authority and, and his legacy. He says, I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as formerly, even from the day when I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up from your descendants after you 
who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. And I shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne. Notice the throne, not the house. The throne would be established, and his kingdom forever. Then verse 16, he says, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Then as David prays in response to this message from God through Nathan in verse 24, he says, For you have established for yourself your people Israel as your own people forever. A lot of people out there saying, well, God's through with Israel. God's over Israel. He's given them their pink slip and and they're done. That's not true. God made a forever covenant with them. Both the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are forever. And you, O Lord, have become their God. Now therefore, O Lord God, the, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken. Then verse 28, Now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are truth and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing may the house of your servant be blessed. How long? Forever. Now again, this wasn't just a truth for the Jewish people, but it was a promise to the entire world that one day in the future the Messiah, the greater son of David, would come and rule from then on and forevermore on the throne of his father, David. Jacob, as he's blessing his twelve sons, comes to Judah. And he says of Judah in Genesis 49.10, he says, he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, that's the, the ruler's staff, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And Shiloh means the one to whom it belongs. And that would be the Messiah. And it says, to him will be the obedience of the peoples. Again, not just Israel, but the peoples, the worldwide conflagration of man would be in obedience to this ruler. So it was imperative that the Messiah's lineage be established as going back to the son of Jesse, the father of Solomon of the tribe of Judah. Now, the third stage of this genealogy is the 14 generations from David to the godly Josiah and his offspring, Jeconiah or Jehoiachin, as he's also called in Scripture, and the destruction of Jerusalem and the deportation to Babylon for 70 years. You recall, first of all, the ten tribes were taken by the Assyrians and scattered, and many of those, all ten of them, if you search the Scripture, you find returned some of a remnant returned to Judah. But then later, around 605 and a and couple deportations prior to that, or after that, Judah is taken captive to Babylon. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. That's what the book of Esther is all about, and so on and so forth. But they're taken captive. And as I thought about this, it became apparent to me that this was a reminder to Israel and all of us that God is holy and sovereign and He will not tolerate our rebellion and sin. He did for a long time with the kings. You know, the kings, you'd get a good king and you'd have reform and Israel would turn to God and then you'd get a bad king like Ahaz and they'd start worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth and all the, 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 the cultic disgusting gods they start sacrificing their children in the fire and so on and so forth and but god will not tolerate that forever although he is gracious and it graphically points out to all of us our desperate need for god's grace and forgiveness and our need for redemption from our sin because judgment always looms in the future the world is not repeating itself it is heading towards a catechismic climax that's what our study in the book of revelation is about on friday morning as we go through that with the men but it is heading towards a climactic ending it's not just repeating itself and on this endless cycle of samsara like the hindus believe but 
we're heading in a direction. Again, this is a visual reminder of our need for the Savior, the Messiah. But I think there's also another reason for the reminder of the Babylonian captivity, and and that's God's grace in Israel's regathering after the 70 years of captivity. You know, sorrow may last for a time, but joy comes in the morning, doesn't it? God is only angry for so long. I've been reading those Psalms in my devotional time that, that talk about God's anger only lasts so long. In fact, in, if you want to read about David's forever kingdom, read Psalms 89. But God's anger only lasts for a time. And we see God's grace in Israel's regathering after the 70 years of ec- captivity. He would bring them back to their land to receive an even even greater blessing, and that would be the Messiah. Because that's the next 14 generations, right? Ends with Messiah. This sort of reminds us of what's going on today, doesn't it? In 70 AD, the Roman legions at the command of Titus destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, killing over a million Jews in the process, and he took about 90,000 prisoners back to Rome, and they cleared Capitoline Hill, and Trajan had them rebuilt his own house, which was unbelievable. It was about a mile in circumference with 30-foot ceilings and all that, and they all died doing that. But Israel was dispersed at that time throughout the nations. But today, since the reestablishment of the sovereign state of Israel on May 14, 1948, God is in the process of regathering them once again, isn't He? God's graciousness is overwhelming, and this time it will end right, won't it? You know, Zechariah 12.10, among other places, tells us they will look on their Messiah, they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for me as one mourns for an only son. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, and so all Israel will be saved. For at the second coming, he will take up the throne of David. And he will take his mighty power and begin to reign, Revelation 11 tells us. So we have what you might call a prefillment and a reminder of a greater fulfillment in the historic and future history of Israel yet to come. In fact, in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, a very familiar passage where it talks about the fact that a son shall be given to us, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And it says, and there will be no end to his government or peace to rule on the throne of David. We need to remember that, that that is a yet future promise and Here is an example of God's graciousness right in the middle of this genealogy when you have the deportation to Babylon and the bringing back of Israel. And you can read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah, if you like. So once again, Israel will be gathered back to their land And once again, it will culminate in the coming of Messiah. Isn't that interesting? Here they're regathered, and it culminates 14 generations later in the coming of Messiah. The next time they're regathered, which is right now, it will culminate in the second coming of the Messiah. That's God's grace. And that's the fourth major event in the history of Israel and the world that this genealogy focuses in on the Messiah came. Not to reign in power and great glory, but as Joseph is told of Mary in verse 21, which we'll see next week, she shall bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, or God saves, Jehovah saves, for he will save his people from their sins. That's why he came the first time. That's why we live in an age of grace. That's what the church age is all about. That's about the gospel. Christ came. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He was the perfect Lamb of God who died on the cross for our sins. He rose three days later, victorious over sin and death. And He offers that as a, 
eternal life as a free gift to each one of us, but not to hoard, but to tell others about. To take it to the world, to take it to Oakhurst, to take it beyond to our families, to our acquaintances, to those we work. Wherever we go, we are purveyors of the Gospel. We're people who tell people about how to know God, how to know Christ. How to be saved. That's the point of this age of grace. The first time Messiah came, He came to redeem Israel. As well as all who would believe in Him by faith. The second time He comes, He comes to rule from the throne of David from Jerusalem over the nations of this world. Revelation 19 tells us He will strike down the nations and rule them with a rod of iron and He will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty as King of kings and Lord of lords. In other words, His rule (coughs) will be total and absolute. No rebellion will be tolerated. And He will rule from then on and forevermore on the throne of David. The age of grace comes to an end, but the gracious King takes up His rule here on earth. And many during that millennial period will be saved. Many will rebel. Many won't take Him up on the offer of the free gift of eternal life. And they'll chafe at the rule of the King, a perfect rule. Men, because they're sinners, chafe at anything. It doesn't matter how good it is. You can never get enough, right? But that rebellion's quelched at the end of the millennium. And then you have the new heavens and new earth where He reigns forever. So we see this genealogy has meaning not only to the Jew, but what's said here has universal application. He is the Son of David. He will rule forever. He is the Son of Abraham. He is the Savior of all, like Abraham, who believed by faith. He is the one who judges sin and rebellion, but He's also the one who restores and redeems. In other words, He's the promised Messiah. For you see, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to call men to repentance and salvation. Famous verse, John 3.16. You see it at every athletic event somewhere behind the goalpost or behind the basket. And it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why? That everyone who believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then verse 17 of that passage goes on to say, it says, For God did not send the Son to judge the world, that's the second coming, but that the world might be saved through Him. That's what He's doing today, isn't it? He's given us a message, the Gospel, the good news, that men might come to faith in Him, that they might believe the the credibility of this genealogy. Now, I believe the Gospel is nowhere more graphically pointed out than in this genealogy. What a crew. Like us, desperately in need of forgiveness of sin and redemption. Like Colossians 1.13 and 14 14 says, that God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. And that really, in essence, is what this genealogy is all about. Think about the people here. There was Abraham, (laughs) the guy who kept getting Sarah thrown in some other king's harem, once in Pharaoh's, once in Abimelech's, to save his own skin. And then when she offered him some skin and Hagar, instead of just producing an offspring, he falls in love with Hagar and Hagar gets banished. And Ishmael and Isaac have been hating each other ever since. Then there was Judah, or there was Jacob, the schemer and deceiver. You can read about him in Genesis. Amazing guy. The guy was master manipulator. Master sinner. Then there was Judah, the adulterous father-in-law, who ends up having relations and two children with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. 
And then Tamar gets in here and she schemed and committed adultery and incest with her father-in-law through design. And then in verse 5, there's Rahab the harlot, a Canaanite and a harlot, who hid the spies when Joshua conquered Jericho and became a virtuous woman saved by grace. Then there was Ruth the Moabitess who came from a nation hated by Israel, but, but there she is right smack dab front and center in Messiah's line. She went back with Naomi and she was virtuous to begin with and she accepted the God of Israel and again was saved by grace. Then there's David. Great king, man after God's own heart. Nobody wanted to go to war with David because not only God was on his side, but David, they said, fought like a bear robbed of her cubs. And he had his mighty men with him, and they were like indestructible. But he was also a murderer and an adulterer. He did things that cost Israel many lives, like when he took the census at the end of Second Samuel or First Samuel. Don't forget Solomon, who did the three things Israeli kings were forbidden to do. He gathered wealth. Uh, money was so gold was so present in Jerusalem. They said silver was worthless. I'd like to get some of that. But uh, <laughs> he gathered horses or military might, because horses equated to military might in those days. It was like having a nuclear arsenal. And he gathered foreign women, who First Kings 11 tells us led his heart astray from the worship of the one true God. Yet he's the wisest, richest king in Israel's history. Blessing of God was on him like no other. Yet he was a sinner. And if you read through Ecclesiastes, you understand that he too needed to be saved by grace. Because at the end, he repents and comes back to God, and it's beautiful. And there was Rehoboam, his son, who split the kingdom. Ten tribes going to the north, northern kingdom of Israel. Two tribes staying in the south, Judah and Benjamin. And there's a host of good and bad kings, men who all had feet of clay, sinners all. And then following the deportation, we have a list of of lesser unknown figures. You'll have a hard time finding any of these men in the Bible. But one thing we can be sure of, they were all sinners in need of Messiah's mercy and grace. Because all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, we see this incredible genealogy traced through the Davidic line of Joseph who was the legal descendant of David, although not the natural father of Jesus, as we'll see next week. But, but that's not all. In Luke chapter 3, if we were to go there, it would trace the bloodline of Messiah through the bloodline of Nathan, David's son, of whom Mary was a direct descendant. So genealogically, Jesus was perfectly qualified to sit on the throne of David. There's enough evidence here for even the most skeptical skeptic to go, yeah, this must be the Messiah based on what the Scripture says. Now let me just end this study this morning with the following insight and observation. It is both interesting and significant that since the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., No genealogies exist that can trace the ancestry of any Jew now living. The primary significance of that fact is that for those Jews who are still looking for their Messiah, his lineage to David could never be established. You get that? And I hope you understand what I'm saying here. Jesus Christ is the last verifiable claimant to the throne of David and therefore the messianic line. There can be no other there. There can be no other that can make that claim. This can't be done. With the backing and authority of the Old Testament scriptures. This is Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the Savior, the Son of Abraham, the Son of David. The search is over. Praise God. 
Only Jesus has the credentials. Only He can be the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God. Put the period at the end of the sentence and close the book. That's how the sure word of prophecy is. Just as, you know, if we were to go over the individual prophecies in here, it would be staggering the probabilities that we would come up with. Scientifically, Jesus cannot not be who He said He was. We always talk about being scientific these days, right? Why are people so afraid of the Scripture? Why are we so afraid to say it like it is? There can be no other Messiah ever. It just can't be. just can't happen. It's the way it is. <laughs> you know, get over it if you think there can be. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek, but Jesus is the only Messiah because He is the only one who is qualified genealogically to be the Messiah of both Israel and the world. Let's pray.